Yeah, so I'm actually going to be uh, demoing on the loader unit itself. I've been able to play around with it this uh, past few days. It's actually a really nice unit. I think it retails for about 120 ish dollars. Uh, it's got some really nice features to it. 120 uh, plug-in unit, so it's pretty nice. So pretty cool that the city is uh, doing that to get people comfortable with the technology before you pull the trigger on a you know full stove and rip out your gas gas unit and put some electric lines in. And so, where to start? Where to for the clicker? So let's see. Put it around here somewhere. Aha! There it is. Ah, there we go. Okay. How many people? So again, my name is Todd Bell. Uh, I'm with a company of Frontier Energy. Our offices are over in uh, San Ramon. I work within Frontier Energy's food service uh, division. So our focus is primarily commercial food service operations and working with that industry. But we also dabble in the residential side. We've done probably uh, past three years when we really start to got some interest from the utilities in uh, residential type cooking appliances. So gas ranges and electric ranges. We just wrapped up a study with SMUD uh, last year that was looking at induction hot tubs. So we went over to Home Depot and the project allowed us to purchase a bunch of different units from Samsung, L, you know, uh, GE uh, induction uh, range tops, as well as the old antiquated type, these guys. How many folks have this in their kitchen? <laughs> or are familiar with these? Maybe go on, see, yeah, reminds me. At some point in your life, you had one of these in a kitchen that you lived in or grew up in. I know I did. Um, and so we tested these and also gas units, and we were able to do a, some uh, comparative analysis of the different uh, technologies and really sh learned that induction, how many people have heard of induction? Are familiar with induction? How many, and if, does anybody have an induction cooktop yet? Looked at one, cooked on one? No? Okay, well, I guess that's why you're here. You're like, I want to learn from you, guys. Come on. So, basically, what, you know, of course, we're talking about decarbonization going from gas, right, which has a pretty big you know, carbon footprint. Um, it's caveman technology for sure, open flame. You know, the open burner, whether you're on the residential, commercial side, hasn't changed for eons. You know, I always get asked that question, especially when I talk to you know, to chefs and cooks, oh, there's, are there more efficient uh, open burners, you know, for my kitchen? Like, no, it's all the same. It's basically a commodity item, right? And on the residential side, they look cool, right? Look, I've got pretty much a commercial kitchen in my house. I've got 200,000 BTUs per hour flame in my, you know, you're, you're never going to use it because all you're doing is, you know, boiling the water half the time. But uh, people, it, it amazes me some of the equipment people are putting in their houses. That belongs in a commercial kitchen with a big exhaust hood that can move, you know, 5,000 CFM of air. Your little U-tone hood that pulls maybe 200 CFM as not a good thing. But, uh, so we have gas, of course, we're looking to make the move to electric. But if you make the move to electric, do you really want to go to this? <laughs> no, this is, this is, you know, kind of almost caveman technology. You know, it's really not that great. Yeah, it's kind of cheap, it'll do the job, but performance-wise, it kind of stinks, okay? And so that's what we will talk about today in my presentation and you know, show you what we learned about this performance. And, you know, we're in the 21st century, gosh darn it. So we're going to, induction, right? Induction is cool. Digital control, smart controls, you can actually program this thing to cook at different levels automatically. I can say, okay, I want to go to I want to go to max for five minutes and boil the water, and then after five minutes, it'll step down automatically to a simmer mode for 20 minutes. So, pretty neat stuff. So, induction, anything that I, you know, heck, they probably got a model out there I can put on a phone app and control it from my car while I'm coming home. And by gosh, I'll finally be able to follow the instructions on this box, right? Because it always says. You put in six cups of water and then, you know, bring to boil and simmer for seven to eight minutes. Well, I know I've probably broken the rules in that number of times. It might cost to, you know, simmer for longer than that eight minutes. But I could program that thing to do exactly that prescribed time on the box. So we can always follow the instructions and never deviate from the norm, right? So 
induction, we'll talk a little bit about what the heck is the technology. And put the clicker down somewhere. <laughs> the absent minded professor here. Um, like I said, we're looking at a technology that's actually been around for a long time. You know, discovered by Faraday back in 1831, long time ago. And it's basically generation of electromagnetic field, right? The changing of that magnetic field is what ultimately is allowed, it can generate heat in a ferrous metal. And so it's used in all sorts of stuff from, you know, electrical components, motors, generators, welding, as well as cookware, like we're talking about today. Um, so it's been around a long time, but really the application of the technology as a cooking appliance Oh, I'm trying to think. I've been, I've been with uh, the Frontier, the Food Service Tech Center since 98. So when I came on board, it was just as some induction technologies had come around about 19. I think we had some there. So that would have been, yeah, late 90s, mid 90s was when induction was being introduced by a few companies. Um, but it really wasn't, you know, there wasn't a lot of uh, penetration out of the marketplace. You know, it was kind of a specialty item. You might have seen this being used at a saute station, uh, you know, on a buffet line or something like that. But certainly, in the past three, four years on the commercial side, we've seen these uh, manufacturers introduce a lot more uh, types of uh, units to the, to the marketplace. So it's in the back of house cooking, prep cooking, uh, warming technologies, induction walks. And then on the residential side, when you go into your Home Depot now, you've got these manufacturers offering the technology as well. So essentially, these are the nuts and bolts of how induction works, right? You're, you know, it's electro. Uh, you've got this uh, coil underneath. So next time you go to Home Depot, you're like, God, what's what's the magic behind the curtain? What's going on? Well, this is what's going on. Basically, a copper coil run the electrical current through it, right? And then it's creating electromagnetic field. When the, remember the key here is a magnetic metal, ferrous metal is introduced into that field, the current eddies pass through that metal and you end up with the resistance in that alternating current, excites the molecules of the pan directly. So the pan essentially becomes an extension of the cooking appliance here and through induction. Whereas it makes it very, very energy efficient. So as soon as I take it away from the field, the appliance stops consuming energy. Okay. So you get direct energy transfer to the cooking surface. The very energy efficient. And that's one of the big things that we focus on at the food service tech center. So there's the guts of what one of these things looks like. Yeah, pretty high tech, uh, digital controls, but the main thing is this copper coil that's generating that electromagnetic field. Again, as soon as you remove that from the electromagnetic field, the unit shuts off. It needs the pan to be in that field for it to actually consume any energy. Nice thing is that makes it very safe, because as soon as I remove the pan, that surface is gonna cool rapidly. Now, so it's significantly different than your old school resistive heating element, right? These guys, Stone Age technology, basically you've got this, uh, the metal core running through the coil, pass electricity through it, the resistance in that causes the coil to heat up, and then through conduction, the contact between the two surfaces transfers the heat to the pan. Not very efficient. The other problem is, is if I take the pan off, as you know, if I don't turn the unit off, it's going to stay on. Okay? And even if I turn it off, it takes a long time for that heat to dissipate. I have a little anecdotal experience on my part, why I'm a little terrified of these things. I was probably about four years old. My mom, of course, we had in our 1960s house an electric range top. She had been cooking something on the range top. She stepped out of the kitchen. Four-year-old Todd walks up to the range top. He's just tall enough to start, oh, what's up here? Oh, let's see, this one's cold. This one's hot. 
So and I had touched it, it was very high. I always remember, I ended up burning the tip of my fingers on this thing, because again, that residual heat, even when it's off, makes these things pretty darn dangerous. So, ugh, I got PTSD from that guy, right? <laughs> so not nearly as safe, uh, as opposed to, again, with the induction, you take away the pan, it turns off, and that surface is gonna cool down really quick, quickly. Performance-wise, they're pretty slow in comparison to the induction. I'll show you that when we do the, uh, the cooking demonstration. You might also be familiar with these ceramic cooktops or glass cooktops. They kind of look like induction. You could walk into Home Depot and go, oh, wow, they've all got these glass tops, you know? No, what those things are is they're basically just this electric heat coil beneath the glass surface. So now you're relying on uh, radio, uh, radiation, transferring a lot of that heat to the pan or cookware and also conduction because it's heating the glass. Uh, these aesthetically, they, they look nicer and they're a little bit easier to clean, so that's why they're popular, but they have a, basically the same performance as these as well as the same drawbacks because you've got that heat that's going to sit there until that coil uh, <coughs> cools down. So those are ceramic cooktops and they can be mistaken for induction, but they are not. And then there's gas. Then there's one caveman technology. Again, it's pretty straightforward, right? It's just you've got your uh, uh, the hob, right? Gas passes through the valve into the burner. Hopefully, you've got a little spark ignition there. Or if that's not working, maybe you pull out your you know your quick stick lighter, light that sucker up, and then you've got fire. And then you're you're off to the races and you're cooking. You're back to your uh, caveman experience, and that's what I'm doing on a nightly basis, and I kind of go, wait, I'm in the energy efficiency game, and I'm still cooking with caveman technology. But when we did our kitchen remodel, it was back many, many years ago, my wife was like, I really want a nice, pretty, you know, cool looking, hot, you know, gas range top, and gas is better, and okay, honey, whatever you want, just okay, and that's what we've got. So we've got something like this. Very poor efficiency, right, because most of that heat is passing around the outside, right? You're heating the air between the burner and the, pot and the pan, you do, and then it's also heating the grate, which it gets hot, so you're transferring heat through conduction. But a lot of that heat is just escaping around the sides of the pan, and it's ending up in your space, so, and not going into that cooking surface. So efficiency is very poor. Fortunately, for us in California, given that gas is a cheaper fuel source than electricity, even as inefficient as gas is, it makes it still cost effective versus electricity in many situations just to use, to stick with gas because it can be cheaper. However, another plus of induction is because it's so efficient and because it doesn't have, it immediately turns off when you remove the pan, you're going to get the energy savings there, right? Whereas you might be inclined to keep that, not turn that gas burner off immediately after you remove it. Uh, if you go into commercial kitchens, you walk into any hotline in a typical kitchen, they keep those burners just on because they're just, you know, going through service, burn, they just leave that thing on. So that burner can be going all the time even when it's not being used. So that's energy being wasted. So very inefficient, big carbon footprint uh, impact. Uh, and as you probably know, you guys were like Berkeley is legislating out uh, gas coming into new uh, commercial residential projects, uh, San Francisco is looking at ordinance like that. So this type of technology could be phased out by code in new construction at least. So yeah, where do we go? What, what makes sense? I don't want to go with antiquated electric uh, technology, I want to go with induction. Now I've been talking about efficiency, and so what the heck is efficiency? Basically, it's a measurement of useful work. How much energy goes into the range top actually makes it into the water that's being boiled in that pot. So it's, a, it's again, a measure of useful work. Now the cool thing for my job and the testing we do up at the Food Service Tech Center, we work with all of a wide range of cooking appliances. So with fryers, food product, french fries, right? So we figure out how much energy goes into the fryer, makes it into the french fries that are being cooked. Or if we're going to do a big rack oven, it's apple pie time. <laughs> and so that, that, so for us, and that's our big selling point to the industry, is we're not, you know, you know, you're not boiling water in a fryer, or you know, 
putting bricks into an oven, you're using actual food product. It's something that a restaurant operator can relate to. Uh, during the course of the testing for these residential rain stops, we did a water boil test, but we also did a saute test with a hammer, right? So it gives some people are a little more inclined to relate to an actual food product as opposed to some simulated food product. Yeah. How does it compare to a microwave? It just keeps the water, not the container. Uh, it's kind of like a completely different application in terms of what you're doing. Um, you can't, you can still brown with a, because again, this surface area would still brown. You can't really brown. Efficiency difference. Oh, efficient, uh, microwave ovens are relatively efficient. Yeah. yeah. But then you have the performance thing. So that's why you are starting. You guys go to Starbucks? Yes. Starbucks fans, put your hands up. If, come on, wait a minute. You've been to a Starbucks. Have you ever had them with their breakfast sandwiches? No? Okay, come on, admit it, guys. You've had them with their breakfast sandwiches. Well, if you walk into a Starbucks, you're going to see a couple ovens on the back back line, right? Uh, and you might notice, oh, this is Turbo Chef. Those are basically advanced microwave ovens that also have hot air impingement. So they're able to cook really fast by blasting the uh, breakfast sandwiches with the microwave to cook them, but then they're able to brown them because they basically have hot air impingement through resistant heat elements. So they're getting, able to get that browning effect. Whereas a, your standard microwave at home, yeah, you're just boiling the water out of it, rubber chicken. You know, God bless my mother, I always remember when she first got her big Linton microwave back in the 1970s and wanted to try to cook a whole turkey in it. It was impressive. <laughs> <laughs> and I was, the other cool thing she had too, because they came out with all kinds of crazy gadgets for microwaves. She had like this hot dog cooker, like it had these prongs that came in, but they were like metal prongs that you would put in the ends of the hot dog. I don't know how this past like muster actually made it to the marketplace because you can't put metal into the microwave. So I remember these things sparking on the hot dogs and the hot dogs exploded. So yeah, took that back, took that back to see what's really quick. But anyway, microwaves, fun times, good stuff. Don't put your dog in there to dry them because that's bad. Yeah, let's maybe try that. But um, yeah, so these are going to be a little bit different than than, than a microwave. But they're similar in the way that a microwave turns completely off at the end of its cooking period. So. So that, again, this efficiency, right? If it, we're really into figuring out how much energy you're buying, how much energy you're putting into the appliance makes it into the food that's being cooked or the water that's being boiled. Okay. And so what did we learn? You know, performance-wise, how do these guys compare? So on the top uh, row, we've got the induction, and we take a half gallon of water boil efficiency. We also did the radiant or resistant heat element and then the gas unit. So you can see the induction is very energy efficient. It means that 86% of the energy it consumes is actually making it into the water that's being boiled. Right? You've got a certain percentage that's going into the pot, a certain percentage is being lost out the size of the unit. But the vast majority of the energy that you're buying, that you're using, that electricity, is going in to the water. The resistant heat element, again, it's okay. Right, 70%, but you notice the gas. Very, very poor efficiency, about 30%. 30% is kind of this magic number for a lot of gas appliances, whether it's a gas oven, a low efficiency or standard efficiency commercial fryer, right? Uh, just not an efficient, they're just not efficient. You lose a lot of the heat, again, in this case, because it's going around the side of the pan and being completely lost, okay? Well, it's heating your kitchen. Yeah, it's true. That's heating your So you are picking up a benefit of heating up, and that's that trade off, right? Well, maybe if I'm, I want to heat my kitchen, but on a hot summer day, it's heating your kitchen. Yeah. It's also helping out the asthma inhaler manufacturer. <laughs> that's true. And I got a slide that just, yeah, we're going to speak to that air quality issue, too. Uh, but the boil time, too. Here's that performance. And this is what we really care about, right? If I'm in a rush, I got to get dinner on the table. I want to boil that water as fast as I can, right? So the induction, 10 minutes, the resistance is 16, the gas is taking twice as long because it's throwing all this energy other places other than the water in the pot. So, you know, you're looking at twice as long to boil water in comparison to the, um, the induction unit, you know, right? So if I, again, a half gallon of water in there, actually, I do that. We'll put, it, we'll put this one to the test, because I have brought the water. Thank you. Oh, thank you. 
<laughs> Never thought you'd have to babysit the speaker, did you? Is that have a stainless steel bottom or is it a Oh, that's the, yeah. So this is, again, it has to be a magnetic pot. They will be on the bottom of the pot. And let's see, or the pan. This one, well, this one's actually made by the, this manufacturer, so we know it's compatible. But on the bottom of the pan, this is a calpheon. There'll be different symbols, and one of those symbols on here is for induction. It's basically, it basically looks like a little spring laid on its side. That tells us that it's induction ready, or it'll actually say induction ready. Yes? I have old pans with copper, copper bottom work. No. It, 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 yeah, copper can be an issue. And actually, in the pamphlet, it speaks to different types of pans. Basically, aluminum, uh, copper, plaid, and you have plaid with, uh, or have an aluminum or a stainless core in them. Those can work. It really depends. Yeah. And the other question is, how does the boiling time compare with an electric tea kettle? Electric tea kettle. Uh, probably would still be, the tea kettle would probably still be slow. Yeah, because you're heating, the tea kettle, you still have to heat up this element first, and then it's transferred to the water, right? Or this is, yeah. Um, but the kettle is also, is enclosed. I've never seen an induction kettle yet. So that's our next test. I'll keep that on my list. Yeah. Yes. I, I, I have a electric kettle. Yeah. And the, there's a very intimate connection between the heater and the water. And it's in two or three minutes, I've got half a gallon boiling. Yeah. So it's pretty fast. Yeah. yeah. And all kettles are kind of different, but yeah, it's a little bit different application. Yeah. So I was able to pick up in one burner induction huh? cooktop for 13 bucks at a thrift store. Yeah. And so now I carry a magnet with me every time I go to the thrift store. <laughs> most of our pots work, but only one of our fry pans work. And so every time I go, I take one of my little magnets and stick to the bottom of the fry pan to see if I can pick one up cheaply. But what's interesting is I've struck out so far. Yeah, you know, just the random ones that people give away and end up at the store. None of them I've found so far have a magnetic bottom. You can get really good deals at IKEA. Okay. Which is bring your magnet. <laughs> yeah, again, the, the, they should, and, and there should be uh, the symbol on the bottom. But yes, carry, always carry magnet in your pocket. In your, in your, in your, in your pocket. Yeah. Um, I just spent a month in a European country where every cooktop I saw was induction. Yep. Yeah. But they also tended to be kind of scoured up and scratched. Yeah. And um, what types of things can you do? Maybe thin film layers of cap or silicone or something that would prevent that? <coughs> in terms of surface maintenance, I do not know. That I would defer I to the maintenance to recommendations. And, yeah. Um, I have a five-year uh, uh, history of, of cooking on induction, and we have some cast iron pans that might be a little rough on the bottom, and we just put a, a piece of parchment paper down because, of course, the surface doesn't get hot, so you can cook right. on top of the paper. So you can okay. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Oh, cast iron works great. Perfect. Yeah. 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 You know what, what frequency the coil is? Is it 60 hertz or is it higher? Uh, or that, these are rated at 60 hertz. Okay. No, no, no. The, no, coil, no. Itself. Oh, the coil itself. I'd have to look at the spec on this one. I'd guess it's a much a higher frequency value than that. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. This one's 1800 watts. So the input power is 60 hertz. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so two things, yeah, so, so we don't run behind on time here. So I put, uh, this is six cups of water. Yeah, let's say we're going to do the old, we're making our mac and cheese. There we go, we've got six cups of water, and we'll put a time on it. So the way this one works is I select my temperature first, so we're going to go max here. So that's um, max input. <laughs> and there we go. It beeps. We know it's on. Zero. There. Set sear. And then you hit start. And time at five. I hear lots of beeping. People are timing that too. Awesome. Okay. So that's clicking away. 
See how long that takes. Uh, the, so the other cool thing, again, coming back to the safety or, you know, the, the really cool feature about this. And she mentioned the parchment paper. So the old chocolate test here, demo. So put the, I can put the parchment paper on both. But again, that surface is within that electromagnetic field. And I'm just gonna, and I've pre-calibrated it. The nice thing is, in this guide book, it tells you what the uh, temp, the surface temperature is of your cooking surface. So for medium high, that's about 300. And, uh, it says about 375 degrees. Okay. Uh, the max temperature on sear is 575. Yesterday I was playing around with this guy. If I leave this unattended at max, it'll take the surface of this pan up to about 650 degrees. That's really hot. And it's not like there's any smart feature on here that says, well, if I turn it down, is that 375? I spent a good hour yesterday calibrating this guy with, it on a, with a pan, <laughs> with a very specific, you know, okay, dialing it in so that I know that this is right there is about 375 degrees, but a typical hot top like this doesn't, or your range top at home will have just numbers. Well, what does that equate to? Where this is, you know, there's a, it's really easy to know. It's referenced in the book, it's programmed in. Yep, I got, I got some bubbles forming there already. And on this, I'm gonna go medium high, hit start, melt some chocolate. I just throw in that our cooktop, you can actually set the temperature on the inductive cooktop. What's that? You can set the wattage or the temperature yeah. on the inductive yeah. cooktop, so there's no lifting it up or anything. Right. So that surface for the chocolate, you can see it's already hot. So it's only melting on one side. Got the parchment paper underneath that, doesn't affect the cook surface at all. Now let's see, we're about two minutes, got some good bubbles going over there. Um, if, and again, if you're if you're into doing so, pastry chefs love this, right? Because they've got it. They've got really you know working with like chocolates and stuff. They really got to have fine temperature control, so they can really dial it in to an exact temperature, and can, you know it'll hold a certain temperature uh, indefinitely. That was very little tinkering of you know of the burn of the open gas burner or these electric speed plugs. So, let's see if it's separate. Yep, there you go. So, there you go. So, this side is completely cool. Uh, this side has some residual warmth left to it, but I can put my hand up on it, right? Pretty quickly. Now, if I did the same thing with this coil, I would not have left my hand there at all. So, so now it's that, hey, uh, hey, hello, uh, there's nothing on the top. You need to turn me off or do something here. Um, and we're just going to go ahead and go pause and then clear, and then it goes back. It's uh, turned completely off. And the nice thing with these is the folks that do have them easy to clean, wipe down. Um, yeah. Does that mean that when you're cleaning the cook, cook top, you never have food that is cooked onto the cook top? Well, you could. So that's that's where following the cleaning instructions from the manufacturer. Right? You don't want to use an abrasive type cleaners. Each manufacturer has different types of materials they're using on the cooking surfaces. But you certainly wouldn't want to scrap, you know, use a real harsh abrasive type cleaner or, you know, uh, uh, But if food falls onto the top, oh, oh, right. So that's the, that's the benefit. This surface, unless you had it on sear, right, it's cooling down so quickly that, you know, it's not going to sit there and burn and cook. Because, again, the, the energy stops as soon as the pan comes off. So it said, okay, there's no more, the input is stopped, so now it's gonna to start to cool down quickly. So if the pan overflows, though, the food that overflows wouldn't get cooked. Yeah, it's not gonna cook. It can't, it, it's not, yeah. It, and, it's, it's, and if oil spatters out of the frying pan, the oil wouldn't get cooked up. Right, it's not gonna splash on the open flame. It's not, it, you know, as opposed to it splash on this heat coil, it would flare up, so you have that safety benefit, too, yeah. I think what will happen is, if, you, if it like if it overflows or if there's spatter that gets into the cooking surface area and now you put a new pan up, you don't clean it, you put another pan down. That would be a problem. It is going to get up to the temperature of that pan. Yes, if, you, yeah, if there was residual yeah. food, like, yes, so, then you're going to so, start the so, food process. So if you're again. doing frying or something in a pan, that could be pretty darn hot. 
Yes. And that's and why that, you want to be that cognizant. That would really be kind of, so you, you right. need to think about that. Yes, you need to be cognizant of what what's on the, on the surface. But from a safety standpoint, if you're, yeah, if your pan, you know, oil splashes from the pan, you're, it's, it itself is not going to flash because it's not, it's coming in contact with the surface, but it's not going to continue to cook because it's not, it, it doesn't generate the electricity. Yeah. Question. I noticed you're wearing rings and a watch that has some metal on it. If those were ferrous, every time you wave your hand over, would you yeah, get so that? Yeah, so this, that, be, you know, this one not being magnetic. Right. But don't put your iPhone on the thing. That's important. Or your laptop. You can't. So how close can you come in and have a watch? Yeah. That would have some ferrous parts. In. Yeah. They're, so in there, potentially. But you, but the field, basically, you've got to be essentially on the surface, from what I've found. Basically, if you lift it to here, you're outside of the field. It's really, really tight. But yeah, they certainly wouldn't want to have this big field. like. Oh, come on, why is my belt getting all hot? You know, you know. <laughs> so. Other questions? Yeah. Is there any way of cooking like a 20 pound turkey with this kind of technology? Or? A 20 pound turkey? Yeah. Well, let's see. You could, if you want to uh, fry your turkey at home and potentially, yeah, cause a big mess and be on YouTube. And, uh, <laughs> you can know. drop a metal box that has insulation around it on top. And the metal would heat up and insulation would heat in. No. Uh, conventional oven for that time. Oh yeah, if you, I mean tur tur yeah, if you're really anything steam like that. Oven. electric steam oven. There you go. Microwave. Yeah. Yeah, I mean really it's meant for, it's meant for you know boiling your water, doing you know, doing your saute, stuff like that. Uh, let's see. We've got almost boil in here. It's been about seven minutes. Getting pretty hot on the water side there. Uh, so we'll let that percolate. Well, so that inductive cooktop is limited by the amount of power you can get through a 120 volt. You know, yeah, yeah, exactly. So if it's this max, again, is 1800 watts. Uh, you know, on the commercial side, they go up to 7,000 7, watts. If you right? got plugged in at home into a 240 volt, volt outlet, yes, and potentially the burner could put out lots of power. Yeah, and I, I don't know if I have the specs from the ones we tested. I think we had some hobs that went like 2,500 watts, so significantly more, and they are bigger too. Yeah. Um, so the, yeah, the, the built your full range of you know 240 volts has a lot more. Uh, so then we also did a saute test as well. Just put a burger on. Um, cook times were about the same, but your efficiency difference is there. Kind of you know again, induction is inherently more efficient. Now the indoor air quality concern, just another note, on the gas side, most residential range hoods do an atrocious job of capturing containing the cooking effluent and the combusted gas coming off of the range. I always know when I come home and my wife's been cooking because she never turns on or exhausted and I can just <laughs> smell that gas smell and whatever she's like, kind of, ah, turn on. Let's see, we got boiling water at eight minutes and 30 seconds. Concur? Okay. Yeah. So we'll go pause there, um, but then I can also take it. Now I can just hit uh, medium low start, or and just uh, pop that down to a simmer. So pretty, uh, pretty cool feature. And then let's we'll click along at that temperature uh, until I change it. So yeah, most exhausted as pretty as they are, they really don't do a good job. And the problem now with modern homes is they're sealed up really well. So you're exhausting this air, but you don't have a lot of replacement air coming back into your into your house. So you end up basically uh, with a vacuum. And you're sucking on a vacuum, so now your hood's gonna spill. So hood, houses are not built like uh, restaurants, which have re actually dedicated replacement air coming into the space so that the hood's gonna work effectively. So as pretty as that center hood is, I can tell you for sure over that, what, we got one, two, eight, that's eight burners. That is probably rated at 200,000 BTUs per hour. That is a serious, serious, that's a, basically a commercial grade uh, range top there. That thing really uh, just, getting all that gas is being ending up in this space. Yeah. So we have a pretty nice uh, propane range. Uh huh. Yep. It's an electric oven, but a propane. Yes. Yeah, gas on top. Yep. And if I'm going to sell my wife on this, 
uh, I have to be able to replace at least the cook top yes. with something like this. So do people make sort of standard size induction cook tops that I could somehow drop in in place of the propane? Uh, so on so on top of your existing? Oh, well, I take off the propane plumbing and all that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and but it's just we already the, have the 240. It's a counter. Yeah. What? It's just a counter mount, right? Yeah. Counter, yeah. Oh, counter mount drop-in. Yes. They make those. And sort of standard yeah. sizes. So. Yeah. So, yeah. Home Depot, Lowe's, they all they have standard drop-in countertop drop-in units. Um, so yeah, like you know, you got the little teeny new tone unit there that really doesn't do a whole lot. So um, anyway, that's the other benefit of going to the induction is that you're getting right rid of that caveman technology and all the byproducts that come up. What is the technology of the ovens that come in the full stove? Uh, we could have an electric oven. Uh, there are some dual types that have like that. Like, uh, that's a huge deal. We can have gas top, electric oven, I think. But uh, you can have dual dual fuel, but you would have an electric induction top and an electric oven. But it would just With be the like heat. a standard oh, electric oven. No, they make them with uh, convection. They, oh, the, the oh, oven is going to be a resistant. Convection. convection. There's no... Take it around that. In terms of that electric oven. Yes, what about? How do they work? I mean, I've got a... An electric oven. Yeah. If I want to get rid of it, make it electric. How am I going to cook a turkey? Oh well, you would just go to this, right? So there. Yeah, it still have. You still have. I mean, that's. They look the same. Right. It's just an electric oven with an induction cooktop. Yeah, cooktop. Oh, okay. Yeah, there's no induction ovens. But I do recommend con a convection model, not a, con not a standard. Or con you really want to have that fan inside, much more efficient, cooks more evenly, and the rest. Yeah. I just wanted to throw out that if for your hood to work, you just go across the kitchen and open a window, so you have air in it. Yep. Yeah, it's always great when you do that in the middle of February. It's freezing us. <laughs> I, know, I know. I've done it many a times. When the kitchen starts to smoke, and it's like, oh, great. Okay, everybody, it's going to get cold in here. Five minutes. I've been told five minutes. Okay. Uh, any other questions at the moment? Have I, have so, you, yeah. Have you experimented with the various brands of the cook caps? Uh, so we tested uh, three: the, uh, an LG, a Samsung, and the uh, and a GE. They all, honestly, the coils are basically coming out of the same plant. It's all the features and bells and whistles that the manufacturers incorporate. Like the, the Samsung actually had some LED lights that went around each burner, to, so it, and the, they would light up, and these blue lights would light up, so it looked like a flame, and that would change depending on your input setting. So it actually gave you a visual feedback to what the burner was doing. Others are, uh, have you know, more robust digital controls for programmability, and some are really just simple you know, knob, right? Okay. Just, so, and that's what really drives the, the price point, like anything else. So that's that range right now. We're seeing nine hundred. You know, premium is three thousand versus you know, and even on the gas side, you know, basic gas oven is five four hundred dollars. But kind of the sky's the limit if you want to almost go to the residential pseudo commercial grade. Right? So that induction that you've got there yes. is that is that the cooktop plus the oven? Yeah. Yep. So cooktop. Yep. And then got the oven. So they basically look the same as the electric ceramic. So. so the IKEA ones, uh -huh. I was looking at IKEA, they're ceramic, right? So that's basically the same as the coils. Yes. They don't have induction. They don't have induction yet. I haven't looked at IKEA. I've just kind of looked at Home Depot, Sears, those guys. I bet you they have induction back home. Right? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Europe's fantastic. I was just in Germany. I was like peeking in every kitchen I could when we went out to eat. Like, that's induction. That's induction. So. And the only 30, so. I was thinking about replacing my range, but the only 36 inch ones are, <coughs> and they're like four or five thousand What What size? 36 inches. 30, oh, you're going to the wider range. Was it Electrolux? No, Electrolux is German. Fertilizer. 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 
Yeah. You can always have a look at it. It's a cabinet extension or a countertop extension. It fills the gap and use the regular side. Right? Yeah. Well, you can center it under your hood and just add a little bit of counter on your side. Mm -hmm. Does it make large pots? So the size, that's the other thing, is the size of the hobs varies. Um, so this one's relatively small. Um, yeah, so the ring size, uh, I think the biggest we've seen in the residential was 12 inches, I think. Uh, this one's eight, I to check the measurements on that. But they do have varying sizes in terms that's of the oh. impact active area. Yes, but they, I think they go up to 12 on the commercial side. They're going up larger, of it's course. Large, the residential side, there's an effective area. If it's large, can you put a small pot on it? Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. Oh, if yeah. It's small, can you put a large pot on it? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it just, it, that the, the field is going to be contained to that yeah. ring. But yes, it would still work. Yeah. Okay. yeah, it's not like gas where people have all these commercial cooktops in their kitchens. And they put a little pot on and like three quarters of the flames go around the pot. Right. All of that's wasted, whereas with inductive cooktop, if there's no metal there, there's yeah. no electric, no energy transfer. Right. Exactly. Nice. Have, they, have they been evaluated for lifespan and reliability? And also, is there any sort of regular maintenance that has to be done? Uh, not that I'm aware of. That's probably more of a, a you know, like consumer reports it as a life cycle testing and stuff. Based on our experience, at least on the commercial side, and there's not a lot of moving parts, right? There's not a lot, lot that can be broken unless you take a pot and slam it on the, on the surface or whatever. Um, so, yeah, they're pretty maintenance free, to be honest. They, they do have, you know, the electric, um, electronics in them, but they're pretty, from what we can tell, pretty robust. Again, on the residential side, your usage is a lot less than a commercial kitchen, so you would expect to get quite a bit of lifespan out of it. But with anything, it's like, check the warranty, right? Yeah, question. Yeah, um, the electronics underneath need, requires some cooling, and usually that needs a certain yes. amount of space of free air. Right. And or free air space. Right. And if you don't put there's heat sink, I think I see there. Right. If you don't provide that free air space, they'll die sooner. That's and, a very good point. Um, yeah. There and you might want to go in there with a little brush and brush the dirt or the dust off of those heat sinks every now and then. Right. So just about so you see this little fan here, that's basically ventilating the heat sink that's keeping the coil and the electronics cooler. Like they, say, they if, they the, if these vents get yeah. clogged up, yeah. then yeah. It's just like a computer fan, they get clogged. Exactly. So what do you have to do, take the, the stove top off to... to um, in terms of, I, I'm trying to think, I can't recall, we didn't tinker too much with the cleaning on those guys. Um, Can the customer get inside the unit? No, you would never want to get inside the unit. Usually what they have, if memory serves, is like a little vent screen that you can pull out and clean. But uh, you know, from manufacturer to manufacturer, I couldn't tell you definitively design-wise. Yeah, worst case scenario, you'd have to pull it out from the wall of chemistries and reach in behind it and clean it. But hopefully they're doing it to vents in the front. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So the design might already be, but because this has vents, most of these vents are actually in the front, so it's a front discharge. Um, but it's also on lines of how often you clean your condenser coils on your refrigerator. Right. <laughs> so we have time for one more question, and maybe Todd can do a quick wrap up. There's actually another session in here. Um, at six, so you're welcome to stay, um, but yeah. we'll need to kind of wrap up. And I think he'll be staying for a few more yeah, we'll afterwards. So if you have questions individually, feel free to ask him. Uh, do you have some final thoughts on uh, No, I think that's it. So what was the question? Yeah. yeah. So does, this, does the speed of cooking uh, depend on the, the mass of the of this metal, the ferrous metal? I mean, if you had a thicker bottom, would it? Uh, for these, no, actually. And the better pans, like this one, they'll actually have a thicker core here. Um, and what we find is the really nice ones, they'll come down at more of a uh, closer to a 90 degree angle. So that way you're effectively uh, taking advantage of the entire uh, uh, coil under the surface, so, right? As opposed to the rounded edge, where you get fade off on the edges. So, so, and they also have a bigger metal core in them. Okay. Yeah, again, it's just all about that electromagnetic field. 
passing through that metal. If you have twice waves. as much metal, you'd have twice the yeah. heat. Yeah, it, it, it starts generating the heat. So let's give Todd a hey, great break.